Hello and welcome to Sunday Politics. The upcoming election should not be framed along the same old battle lines and the same old arguments. That's the message the SDLP leader gave to delegates at his party conference on Friday. So what should the election be about? That's one of the questions I'll be putting to Colm Eastwood, who joins me live in the studio. And as the election campaign proper gets underway, we'll assess the current state of play with commentators Suzanne Breen and Alex Kane. Colm Eastwood described Stormont's response to the cost of living crisis as shameful. He was speaking at his party conference in Balahi two days ago, where he also called on the next executive to approve a 6% pay rise for nurses and carers. He said it would be a reward for their work during the pandemic. Our political editor, Enda McClafferty, was there. We're better to seek inspiration ahead of a key election battle than at the home of a Nobel Prize winning poet. Seamus Heaney was a master at moving people with words. The SDLP leader was hoping to move voters with his. So too his deputy leader and party's only minister, who took aim at the DUP, accusing them of peddling the politics of fear. The truth is for DUP voters, vote Jeffrey's party and you'll get Jamie Bryson politics. Around 100 delegates attended the rearranged conference which was postponed last month after the sudden death of the DUP's Christopher Stalford. They listened as the party leader dismissed Stormont's response to the cost of living crisis as shameful. I for one am deeply ashamed because it should shame every political leader that families have been let down so badly. It should most of all shame Geoffrey Donaldson that he has refused to nominate a First Minister to deal with this emergency and release the £300 million that Stormont is sitting on. Ukraine and the Covid pandemic also featured as he proposed a 6% pay hike for nurses and carers. But his key target was the DUP. They forced through a hard Brexit against the democratic wishes of people here. They got their hard Brexit and in the process helped remove Theresa May and install Boris Johnson. And now, after all that, after getting the Brexit they said they wanted, they can't deal with the damage of their own actions. Is it really any wonder that Geoffrey's cunning plan is crumbling beneath his feet? Is it really any wonder that the only place they've led their own people is to Market Hill to get booed on a snowy night in February? The SDLP is fielding 22 candidates, more than half first-time runners, in a bid to build on its 12 assembly seats. But recent polls suggest the party will struggle. A lot of these polls are taken on very like, small samples. Like We have to really see in the proper election, because we've seen polls before, haven't really like explained many elections, so I think we need to see that it'll be OK. I mean, at the end of the day, they're just polls. I think polls are not fully reflective of the public attitude. And uh, a lot of polls, like the recent ones, are, I think, more favourable to the likes of First Past the Post. I believe that people are actually looking towards leaders who are not afraid of dealing with the proper issues. We're moving to a new generation where orange and green isn't that important to them. You know, borders aren't that important, but what is important is being able to heat their home, put fuel in their car, put food on the table. Transfers were key for the party last time round, getting MLAs over the line, and will be again. What we'll be looking out for, does vote column get Mike last? You know, that was key in Upper Pan and Lagan Valley. Does that last? It remains to be seen. Um, but again, the SDLP are transfer friendly. They'll get transfers from the Alliance Party, they'll get transfers from the Greens and from the Ulster Unionists. The key question that we're all scratching our heads about in this election is how much of the vote column get Mike uh, transfer pact uh, stays in place. Seven years after he took charge of the SDLP, Colm Eastwood is under pressure to deliver more Assembly seats. Standing still is not an option, but judging by the polls, he's got a battle on his hands. But Lafferty reporting and Colm Eastwood joins me now. Um, thanks for being with us. There is every chance this election, for a lot of people, will be about the protocol, the constitutional issue, maybe a future border poll. What do you want it to be about? Well, I think it should be about delivery. I think when I speak to people, and we've been knocking doors for months, and I think we're very plugged into the community, what people are telling me is that they're absolutely petrified about the rising costs of fuel, 
food. Uh, they can't even heat their homes. These are people who are out working uh, every single day, have no ability to heat their homes. They're worried about putting food uh, on the table for their children. For me, that's the most important issue right now. After that, it's a health service because a quarter of our population are languishing on a health waiting list, a hospital waiting list. I don't think that's okay. I think that's the kind of politics that we should be engaged in. They're the kind of issues that people are concerned about. And I understand that, you know, the media and commentators want to talk about the protocol, but, you know, people are telling us and they're telling every pollster that the protocol is nowhere near their top issue. Um, but by the way, if it is, then I think we've been right on the protocol. We've been right on Brexit. Okay. We've been trying to protect uh, people and businesses here from the worst excesses of the DUP and the hard right of the Tory party. I don't think it's that the media wants to talk about the protocol. It's that some of your political opponents want to talk about it, and it is part of the public debate. Just, just before we move on to some of those issues, which we do need to talk about, why would anybody vote for any of our politicians in Northern Ireland. There is a huge cost of living crisis here at the moment. There's £300 million sitting on the table. The executive cannot agree on how to spend that money. Well, I think they could agree if they could get a meeting. Uh, the big problem here is that Geoffrey Donaldson pulled down the executive in the middle of this crisis. Geoffrey must be speaking to the same people I'm speaking to. He must know what people are going through and the most poor in society are going through this, but everybody is going through this real difficult uh, issue. They're not getting any money in their pockets from uh, the executive. There's £300 million there. It is shameful that we can't get that money out the door and that's why the SDLP have been working for weeks to try to uh, bring in emergency legislation to get the Assembly back okay, up so, so we, could we could spend that money and give it to people. All right, so you want to talk about all of these other issues because that's what you think people are interested in. Just, just to be absolutely we'll clear, five, 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 and we will in a moment or two, but, but ideally you've told me what you would like this election to be about. So five and a half weeks away from the election, you're not planning to allow yourself to be drawn into discussing the protocol and Northern Ireland's future constitutional position, if you can avoid it. Is that right? Well, I spoke about both of those things on Friday. I mean, politics is about everything. I have long-term views on what I want this country to look like. I have very strong views on how we protect people and businesses around the protocol. I think I've been talking about them for about six years, almost constantly. But right now, what I'm worried about, and, and sometimes we have to get our heads out of the political bubble, what I'm genuinely worried about is what people are going through. I yeah, speak to them every single day. There's a contradiction day. here, because you said in your speech on Friday, this election shouldn't be framed along the same old battles and the same old arguments. If that's the case, why did you recently criticise Naomi Long for not having a clear stance on a border poll? Well, I was asked the question that I think it was sustainable for any political party in the north of Ireland or the island of Ireland to not have a position on the future of the island, of the island, and I don't think it is. I mean, it's for the Alliance Party. If that's their position, that's fine. I, I respect but the Alliance the Party. But it's the USP of like... the Alliance Party not to have a yeah, position that, that... on that. And Naomi Long has made that clear. You said well, you it's the answer, job you? of political leaders to take a position on the issues that will define the future and to say what they think is best for all our people. And when yeah. I spoke to Naomi Long recently, twice recently, in fact, she said you know, our position is that we don't want to get drawn into that debate. Well, first of all, I didn't go out looking for this argument. I was asked a question and, yeah, and, I, and I gave an answer, yeah. yes, and that's what I tried to do, and I'm going to answer your questions as well. My view is there's constitutional uh, discussion coming. I think it's already started. Our position is clear in that. We're going to do the work to try and convince others of it. I think when that time comes... I would think it'll be very difficult, actually, for the Alliance Party to not hold a position. If they want to not hold a position, that's fine. My view is this is about the future. It's about young people. It's about a progressive type of society. It's about being back in the European Union. I don't know how you can't have a position on that. I just don't think it's sustainable in the long term. Okay. It's for others to decide what they do. Our position is clear. We'll stand on that position when the time comes. Right now, I want to get money into people's pockets so they can heat their homes and feed their children. Okay. An Irish Nationalist Party being <clears throat> led from Westminster and performing poorly in the polls. That's the criticism you levelled. Well, just bear me, bear, just bear with me for a second. That is the criticism you levelled at your predecessor, Alistair MacDonald, when you challenged him for the leadership of the SDLP back at the end of 2015. Now, that's a bit embarrassing when you look back at it now because that's precisely the position you find yourself in. Not a, not a bit embarrassed. In fact, the last poll that matters was the last Westminster election, when everyone told us we weren't going to do well, uh, my majority is 17,000. Uh, Claire Hannah's is about the same. We got huge mandates from the people because people wanted us to go there and represent them. You know, the world changes very quickly. Brexit has happened. We had two years where we didn't have anybody really other than the DUP speaking up for the 
anti-Brexit majority in Northern Ireland, I felt it was important that we send people there to stand up to Boris Johnson, to stand up yeah. to the DUP and, then, and to speak on behalf yeah, of I the know, population. Sure. But listen, one of, the we, criticisms you well. made, one of the criticisms you made of Alistair MacDonald uh, when he was leader of the party, one of the reasons you gave for running against him no, was no, that it really the SDLP good. could not be led as a nationalist party from Westminster. Well, really I, I actually listened to that interview that you gave at the time again this morning. You were crystal clear. Yeah, and that and was, now you're doing precisely the it, same it was, thing. It was a long time ago. It was it was six or seven years and ago. Things haven't got any better. Well, things have changed massively for the po population out there, and that's what I'm worried about. I'm not worried about polls. I'm worried about what's going on, and the fact that we have Boris Johnson in government now. We have a hard Brexit being driven by the DUP and the Tory Party. Do you not think we need people there to stand up for them? Yeah, the, and the, I, the, prob I, the problem I, no, is no, no, that no, you no, haven't made any so. impact. If you, let, you haven't really? improved really? things. Really? Yes, yes, really, yes, really. really. When's you challenge Alison. Okay, well, okay. Hear me out again. You challenged Alistair MacDonald's um, leadership and under you the party is doing no better because when Dr MacDonald was leader of the SDLP it had 14 MLAs and three MPs and you lead a party now with 12 MLAs well, and for, two MPs. Well, well first of all it was 14 out of 108 and that's 12 out of 90. We also lost three MPs in a very difficult election. We got two of them back with big mandates and we came very close to getting a third. I think any objective analysis shows that the SDLP is stabilised under my leadership and will grow again That's in this election. That's not what the polls say, is it? If Which you look polls? at the three most recent polls, well, the three most recent opinion polls, have you at 12, elections. 11 and 10? I know talk, you'd love to talk about the well, Westminster election yeah, when, when and people, you'd love to talk about the European election. When, when people That's, actually voted, yeah. I'd love to talk about the population out there, the people actually voting. Because I don't, frankly, care what a poll says. I only care what elections say. Because whatever you might think, whatever I might think, in that election, you'll have one vote. I'll have one vote. Yeah. And everybody else will have one vote. And they'll get their the opportunity to cast that vote. The SDLP's got fewer votes than it had a long time ago. Let's look a at long the, time the, ago. The, the 1998 high watermark for the SDLP. Hang on, hang Mark, on. Every the, time the, I the high watermark, studio, you want 178,000 votes, 22% share. In 2017, you got 96,000 votes and 12% share. So in 19 years, you managed to lose 82,000 votes. And guess what? The, yes, the, the Sinn Féin over the same period picked up 81,000 votes. I hadn't noticed that. You know, people watching this TV program aren't interested in how many votes somebody got in 1998. Well, they might what be interested, interested to see in how far what the SDLP in... has fallen and wonder why you're so convinced well, they're, it's on the way up they're when all of the recent polls suggest that's not the case. But every time I come in, you want to talk about numbers. What I want to talk about is people and the concerns that people have, the fact that they can't heat their homes, the fact that they are really, really struggling, the fact that many of our young people are leaving our shores, and we've a government for 15 years that has done very little about it. Okay, now, in so any, and sorry, hold on, in any other political context, we would be asking, why is the government not delivering? Why are the top two parties that you've told us for 15 years you've have been, been doing so well? Government. Well, we've had one seat in a multi-seat multi -seat government. The DUP and Sinn Féin have run the government. That is well known. Everybody accepts that. Uh, we've been part of trying to do our best in the middle of that. But it's been utterly impossible with the DUP and Sinn Féin running the place in any other I political thought Nicola Mallon was doing any, a great job as yes, the infrastructure in, minister. In, in, in the position well, that you she can't has. have it both ways. Actually, do you know, Mark? You can, because in the positions that we've held, we've delivered things. We've delivered lots of things, but we can't pretend, and we will never pretend, we've been running the government. Now, come on. You can't tell me, in one, on one hand, that Sinn Féin have got all these votes, and then they've, they, haven't, uh, they haven't been in charge. They've been in charge, absolutely, as of the DUP, jointly for 15 years. What have they delivered for people? Surely that's what we should be asking. People in have an voted election. for them. It, people have yes. voted for them. And they have a chance they're they're not there because of some sort of, course, of magic of spell. Of course. And I think people should be held to account for what they've done when they've been in government. Right. And so, I think now is the time to change how that government looks and try to get delivery for people. OK, so on the 5th of May, if people choose to vote for the SDLP, are they voting for the SDLP to be in government again or are they voting for the SDLP to be in opposition? We want to be in government. We run to be in government. That's why we'll produce a manifesto. And our focus is getting a government in the first place because right now it is a big question as to whether or not we'll have a government. Jeffrey Donaldson won't even tell us whether he'll nominate a first or deputy first minister. I think that's the biggest problem that we face right now. But the SDLP are determined to be in government. Right. So what we think would be I better. I just want to be absolutely clear about that. If you get the votes that give you a place at the executive table, you will take that seat. We will go into a negotiation about what that government will actually do. Ah, that's I, different. That's different. You're not giving a cast well, iron commitment to be that's in how, government. But that's how it works. But that's the question we're I asked run, you. We're Can you give a cast iron guarantee? Well, you I, will take that seat well, at the table. I give you a cast iron guarantee. We'll go into those negotiations yeah, and try to different. get a program. Well, I'd love to be able to answer a question, Mark, without <laughs> that, being interrupted. 
the, this is how it works. I'll, I'll explain how it works. So you get elected. Yeah. You get your MLAs. You go up. You have a negotiation about what that government might actually do. We have very strong ass about trying to protect people in the middle of this cost of living crisis, trying to sort out our economic problems and trying to sort out our health service. And if we can deliver what we want to deliver in government, absolutely. That is our number one priority. We've gone into opposition before. Do you know why we did it? Because we couldn't even get the DUP and Sinn Féin to negotiate with us about anything. They just said, either you're in or you're out. They gave us absolutely no choice. We wanted to be in government then. We want to be in government now. We're determined to be in government. Yeah. That is our number one choice. But, we but think a vote for be. the SDLP could be a vote for your party to go into opposition. Nicola Mallon, on The View, back in January, told me your party wants to be in government, just as you've said. But, she said, if it looks like we're going to affect greater change by going into opposition, then we won't shy from going there of course, of course, Of course that option's on the table. The, the point is we don't want to, to take that option. We want to be in government. But if the other parties are not prepared to deal with the issues that are faced by our public right now, and of course they're proven right now, and Jeffrey Donaldson in particular, yeah, here's the thing, and the though. DUP in particular, you, you want to talk about mechanics of government? I want, to no, talk I, about, I want to talk about the public out there who are desperately in need of help. And Jeffrey Donaldson has walked away from his responsibilities, meaning there's £300 million in a bank account that can't be spent, that can't be given to people, yeah. that can't help people pay their fuel bills and put food on the table okay, for their so children. Here's the for other me, thing. that is the number one, number two, and number three issue on the agenda, oh. not whether the SDLP take up a position. I want more SDLP uh, ministers. I think we can do much better if we have more SDLP MLAs yeah. and more ministers but here's the problem. more change If, if, if you're a nationalist watching this and deciding how to vote on the 5th of May, you will hear that quite complex answer to no, that question. No, it's an question. honest answer. Honest you, you answer, fair enough, fair enough. From but, it's, but, it's, but it's a complex one and people will have to listen very carefully and work their way through um, that process that you've just laid out for us. If you ask Michelle O'Neill the same question, she says, yep, we will be in government. We want the executive reform straight away after the election and I want to be first minister. So you yeah. could conclude your vote is wasted with the SDLP Hi. and you can throw your weight behind Michelle O'Neill and guarantee <laughs> a historic first nationalist First yeah. Minister and, in Northern and, Ireland. And what will that do? Because Michelle O'Neill has been the First Minister of Northern Ireland since the day in Irish she became the Northern Leader of Sinn Féin. Martin McGuinness was the First Minister of Northern Ireland. Mark Durkham was the First Minister of Northern Ireland. And so was Seamus Mallon. They are exactly the same positions. One can't do anything without the other support. And to see this phony sectarian row about who's going to be top dog, it makes absolutely no difference. Because if Sinn Féin win this election, in other words, they come out first, and the DUP come out second, then we'll have a DUP and Sinn Féin joint First Minister, just like joint First Ministers have been for the past 15 years. That's assuming is, the executive well, comes back of well, course. Like, and you that, said yourself there's a question mark a big, over it's, that. A, it's a big assumption because I, all of the, the, both of those two parties haven't given full commitment to this executive. Okay. The DUP right now by the way are at fault and at blame for what is happening. Well, now you've made that our, point very clear and I'm sure Jeffrey Donaldson would dispute your interpretation well, good of good luck it. to him let because me, he's the one that okay. walked out. Alright, let, let me ask you this just finally. What precisely is the current status of your party's partnership with Fianna Fáil? It doesn't seem to have gone anywhere and you are reported to be wanting to reverse out of it. Is that correct? Well, reported by who? What we have had is a policy partnership with Fianna Fáil. Yeah, reported and by the Irish Examiner a number of no, weeks I, ago I, with multiple I, I, sources. I, I read that sure, and the, mul sure the, the, the multiple sources came from exactly the same place. I have been very clear the whole time this has been a policy partnership that has been about ch trying to change people's lives. And let me give you the evidence of what has happened as a result of that. There's one billion euros, one billion euros in a bank account in Dublin to be spent by the Shared Island Unit. That was done as a result of the conversations I had with Micheál Martin. And if that is the result of, mm. of, of that partnership, I'd be pretty happy it, that we it, could well, spend that one billion pounds. Is that special relationship with Fianna Fáil continuing? Are we going to see Micheál Martin up on the on the hustings? Well, he's um, in Derry on Friday and, and we'll have support. Is, is we'll he have there support, supporting we'll, SDLP candidates? We'll have support from right across the political divide in the South, as we ah, always well, do. But that's different. So well, it's not an exclusive relationship with Fianna Fáil, which is what you told us it was going to be at the time. Well, look, we have a very strong relationship with Fianna Fáil. I have a very good working relationship with Micheál Martin, as, as everybody knows. Is the and exclusive we, relationship but do you, with her? But what we I mean, that's a yes or a no. You, you said you'd give me an honest answer. Here's a question. Give have, me an honest a, answer. A, a, is the exclusive a, partnership between the SDLP and Fianna Fáil have, over or not? No, it's not over. We have a particular relationship with Fianna Fáil. And for us, as I said at the time, and if you want to go back and listen to it, never mind what commentators said or what leaks said, what I said at the time is about changing people's lives. And if you want to look at what we've done, €1 billion Euros in a bank account to be spent on cross-border projects. That's okay, a pretty right. big legacy right. of any project, in my view. We need to leave it there. Appreciate your time. Thanks for coming in to join us today. Let's get some analysis of that from the Belfast Telegraph's political editor, Suzanne Breen. Suzanne, um, welcome 
to you. Um, well, Colomie Stewart is very clear that we should be looking at particular elections um, which underscore a turnaround, as he sees it, for the SDLP. But when you look at some of the most recent opinion polls, uh, they're not so favourable. He seems quite keen to discount those. Um, where do you think the truth lies in that debate? Well, the polls aren't favourable to the SDLP and that's the danger. I think for so long the SDLP has been labelled with the loser tag within nationalism and, you know, th that people like to back winners and that was the, the, the problem for the SDLP. People thought, you know what, they're good people, they're decent people, but there's no point voting for them. So people rallied behind Sinn Féin. Now, the 2019 Westminster election kind of changed that away, all away because the the SDLP didn't just win, it won big. It, it won big, as Colin pointed out, in South Belfast, and it won big in Foyle. And I think that built an expectation that the SDLP was once again on the rise and that this was going to carry on into the Stormont election. And yet the party does seem to be stalling. Um, at the Westminster election, Sinn Féin was on 23%. The SDLP was on 15%. That's an eight-point lead. But it's still one that can be closed. Whereas I think the last Lucid Talk opinion poll for the Belfast Telegraph put Sinn Féin on about twice the vote that the SDLP was on. I think the SDLP was on 11% and Sinn Féin was roughly on 25%. And the framing of this election does not suit the SDLP at all at a time when Sinn Féin clearly is in a position to become First Minister. That has an appeal way beyond the Republican base in the nationalist community. And the more in the election that the DUP is going to reel about that and shout about it, then I think the more nationalists will be tempted to give Geoffrey Donaldson's party a bloody nose. And as votes, I think, were lent to the SDLP in the Westminster election to get Colm Eastwood and to get Claire Hanna elected against a backdrop of Brexit and Sinn Féin not taking their seats in the House of Commons. I think the danger for Colm Eastwood okay. is that some in the nationalist community, some SDLP voters, lend their votes to Sinn Féin in this election. And just, just briefly on this as well, is it also possible that some soft SDLP voters choose to go to Alliance and the Greens? Because as the SDLP seems stuck in the polls, those two parties seem to be doing pretty well. I think that that's another big danger to the SDLP, particularly the challenge from Naomi Long. She is much more palatable to nationalist voters than David Ford, John Alderdice or any of her successors where we see again in opinion polls, she's very popular with nationalist voters, much more so than with unionist voters. Actually, we saw that she took the third seat in the European election and there's constituencies that really it is alliance that is posing a challenge to the SDLP in the fourth coming election. It's going to be whether Conor Houston takes that seat in Strangford or whether two Alliance candidates get elected. The same is true in Lagan Valley where Pat Catney is up against it and Alliance is hoping for two candidates. So I think the, the SDLP is fighting battles on two fronts. The traditional battle it has always fought with Sinn Féin okay. and now it needs to see off a new challenge from Alliance. OK, Suzanne, thanks very much indeed. Stay with us. I want to widen the conversation now to look at the uh, entire campaign. Alex Kane joins us. Alex, the um, posters are starting to go up all over the place. Let's talk about the DUP. Uh, Colm Eastwood there, very critical of Geoffrey Donaldson's decision to withdraw the First Minister, and he says that's the reason that this £300 million cannot be spent. Um, the DUP clipping its wings voluntarily, perhaps by running 30 candidates. Some people thought maybe they'd run more. Is that just a, an acceptance of the political reality of where that party is at the moment? Well, I think it is an acceptance. They know they have a problem. They ran 38 candidates last time, 30 this time. They won 28. They need to hold every one of those seats. They have no room for loss there at all. And in even somewhere like South Belfast, where they've, since 1998 they have run two candidates, they're only running one. Other, can, other constituencies, the same thing, Mark. They have rode back a little bit, which would suggest that, and they do internal private polling, it suggests that they probably sense they're going to lose some of their vote. Now, they can, they can lose a little bit, maybe 2 or 3% in every one constituency. Once they go above that, they have a huge problem. So they are they are just being very sensibly careful in this case, in fact, but very small slippage. It doesn't take much Could see them down to 25, 26 seats, which means they would be behind Sinn Féin. 
Um, and a quick word on the challenges for the Ulster Unionist Party and the TUV, because both of those parties have a lot to prove in five and a half weeks' time. Well, do you know, you need to go back, if you look for, at the elections from 2003 to 2017, the DUP didn't have to think at all. The DUP could have come up with any policy. It was sweeping the Unionist vote, taking a huge majority of the overall Unionist vote. That's not going to happen this time. There is a huge rivalry between the TUV, the UUP, the DUP, over the protocol, over the First Minister post, over, over, just over everything, in fact, Mark, and if that continues all the way through into the election, we may find you could call it for the past five elections, you could call almost to two percent the DUP vote, the TUV vote, the UUP vote. I have no idea at this stage. The DUP could take a massive fit or it could in fact do reasonably well. The, the voters, unionist voters, are confused. They don't know. They, they're told, oh, you know, anti-protocol, bring the protocol down. If that means bringing the assembly down, go ahead and bring it down. But it's another section of unionism worries that if you bring all of it down, that you suddenly find that unionism is in this place where it's under direct rule, under the rule of the very people who presented them with the problem of the protocol in the first place. So effectively, I mean, in a word, what you're saying is there's all to play for in the next five and a half weeks as far as those unionist parties are concerned. I don't want to over-egg it, but yes, this, in, in, as someone from a unionist background who's worked in unionism, I think this is going to be one of the most fascinating elections for unionism for the past 25 years. Suzanne, your paper's publishing another lucid talk poll tomorrow and the parties will presumably study that very carefully um, as we approach polling day. It is, and I think what, what we are looking to see is, is the DUP finally starting to close that gap um, on Sinn Féin? I think there was an eight-point lead by Michelle O'Neill's party last time. We're five weeks out from an election. Geoffrey Donaldson really needs to be making up ground. We'll be looking to see if the TUV vote, it was on 12% last time, if it is holding up. Again, Geoffrey Donaldson needs to start eating into Jim Allister's support, starting winning back those voters who drifted away liking the TUV's hard line on the protocol. We've also asked voters um, in the unionist community whether they think that if, if a unionist party finishes second, it should accept the deputy first minister position and serve under Michelle O'Neill. And we have asked nationalists how important the issue is for them. Do they want a nationalist first minister just as unionists want to keep that position? Um, Alex, very quickly, if you would, we had the first um, leader interview on The View with Naomi Long on Thursday night. Do you think that party is going to continue with its surge that we saw in the three most recent elections? I, I think it's probably likely. You know, um, She doesn't seem to be putting a foot wrong. That's what five weeks, Mark, she could make a huge mistake. Alliance could make a huge mistake somewhere. They're not going to be hit by their agnostic position on the border poll. They're not going to be hit by their, their position on the protocol. It, if they make a mistake, it'll be an internal mistake. But okay. I think they'll survive. OK, well, it's going to be a very interesting uh, run into the election. Thank you both very much indeed for joining us uh, today. That is uh, just about it. Just before we go, a quick reminder about our Red Lines podcast. We are profiling all 18 constituencies ahead of the election. The latest episode looks at the parties and personalities in Fermanagh, South Tyrone, West Tyrone and Mid-Ulster. That conversation and all previous episodes are available now on BBC Sounds or wherever you get your podcasts. That's all we have time for this week. Join me for The View at the usual time on Thursday night on BBC One when we'll be continuing our series of interviews with party leaders ahead of the election. This week, the Ulster Unionist leader Doug Beattie will be live in studio with me with reaction and analysis straight afterwards. For now, they're from all of us. Bye-bye. <laughs>